because the sin of unbelief is separation from God because when we disbelieve God, we're effectively calling him a liar. We're saying, no, God, you can't do what you said you were going to do. You're not going to come through on your promises. We're calling God a liar and we're saying, I don't believe you. This is season 12 of Guerrilla Christianity. My name is Pastor Brett Walker, and I'd like to thank you for listening to Guerrilla Christianity, an unconventional, no apologies exposition of God's holy word from a traditional Methodist point of view. God's word is central to all that we believe, so let's get into God's word right now. And I would also invite you to take out your Bibles, either the ones that you brought with you or the ones in the pews, and turn in them with me to the book of Hebrews, chapter 3. Chapter 3, verses 7 through 19. Uh, We've been going verse by verse through the book of Hebrews in our series called In These Last Days. The author of Hebrews tells us that God, who spoke through the prophets in olden times, has now spoken to us through his son, Jesus Christ. This letter was written to Jewish Christians in Rome under persecution from Nero. And so the focus of this letter is to encourage the believers not to return to their Jewish practices, but to embrace a life of faith in Jesus Christ. That their faith is not in vain, and that they should stay the course. Jesus is superior to the prophets, to the angels. And last week we saw how Jesus is superior to Moses, who is counted as the greatest prophet in Israel's history. This week we look at the history of Israel for an example of what not to do in remaining faithful and steadfast to the promises of God. Let us hear the word of the Lord for us today. Hebrews chapter 3, verses 7 through the end of the chapter. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, today if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation, in the day of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. Wherefore I was grieved with that generation, and said, They do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Take heed, brethren, lest there be any in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. While it is said, Today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation. For some, when they had heard, did provoke, how be Howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. But with whom was he grieved for forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. This is the word of the Lord for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Well, last week, the author of Hebrews presented the case that Jesus is superior to Moses, who was the greatest prophet in Israel's history. We are told that Moses was faithful over God's house as a servant And Jesus is faithful over God's house, the church, the body of Christ, that's us. Jesus is faithful over God's house as a son and heir. So he begins this week, after telling us all that, he gives us a rather lengthy quote from uh, Psalm 95. Now, as I said in the very beginning of the series, The writer of Hebrews is very well versed in the Old Testament, but the Old Testament that he uses is uh, the Greek Septuagint. 
And so here I have a copy of the Septuagint, which is the Old Testament in Greek. And so I'm going to read to you uh, Psalm 95. Now, before any of you get really impressed with my prowess, uh, this particular Septuagint has training wheels. It's got the English translation on the side. So don't think too much. Um, but it also has the, the Greek in the middle. So, you know, whatever. Anyway, Psalm 95 begins by saying that it is the praise of a song by David. And it says, Come, let us exult in the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to God our Savior. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great king over all gods. For the Lord will not cast off his people. For the ends of the earth are in his hands and the heights of the mountains are his. For the sea is his and he made it and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us worship and fall down before him and weep before the Lord that made us. For he is our God and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation according to the day of irritation in the wilderness, where your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works. Forty years was I grieved with this generation and said, they do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. It's an interesting psalm because David writes this psalm. He begins in an attitude of worship toward God. And he's inviting, it's like a call to worship. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before our God and maker. For we are his, for he is our God and we are the people of his hand and the sheep of his pasture. But then he all of a sudden changes direction. He says, today if ye will hear his voice, he's telling the people, Listen, listen to the word of the God. He says, harden not your hearts as in the provocation according to the day of ill irritation in the wilderness. Now he changes just, you know, who is speaking. He says, where your fathers tempted me and proved me and saw my works. Now he's speaking as a prophet. David is speaking as a prophet on behalf of God. So the whole tenor of the psalm switches gears right in the middle. All of a sudden, God starts proclaiming, don't tempt me. Don't, uh, don't act like those people in the wilderness who tested me for 40 years, and they were not allowed to enter into my rest. And this is the text that the, that the, the writer of Hebrews is using today in Hebrews chapter 3. Wherefore... As, God, as the Holy Ghost saith. Now notice there, number one, he is attributing this writing, even though the psalm is attributed to David, it's a psalm of David, he says this is the Holy Ghost speaking. The Holy Spirit. As the Holy Ghost saith. And what the, what the writer of Hebrews is telling his readers and us today is that they believed, and they still believe, like as we believe, that all of Scripture is given by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the ultimate writer of these, uh, of these texts, okay? That God is speaking through the people who actually put pen to paper, okay? So David wrote this psalm. It is the mind of David that came up with this song of praise. And yet it was God, through the Holy Spirit, speaking through David that was writing each word. Now, we, we talk about the verbal and plenary inspiration of the Bible. And what that means is that every verbal, every word is God's word. Plenary meaning all of it as a whole, is God's word, okay? 
How can that be? It's not that God stood there and said, hey, David, take this down. This is what I want you to write down. Write it down word for word and don't miss anything. But the Holy Spirit inspires. Okay, the word inspiration actually talks about kind of like breathing in, like respiration, breathing in and breathing out. And so the word of God is described in uh, the fourth chapter of Second Timothy as be, or I'm sorry, the third chapter of Second Timothy, as being God breathed or God's own breath. It's uh, a theopneustos, which means God's breath. It is the very breath of God. That is what Scripture is. And so the writer of Hebrews says it was the Holy Ghost who said this, the Holy Spirit, and this is what he says today. If ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation, in the day of temptation, in the wilderness. Okay, so rebellion, quarreling, testing, uh, temptation, these, these are the words that are being used. And in fact, in the Hebrew, they are two words that uh, you might have heard before, which are masa and meribah, okay? Now, why would you have heard those words? Because they're the names of places that Moses gave to this place. So here's, here's a little rundown of what happened, okay? Um, God tapped Moses in, uh, in Midian. He was a goat herder at that time. He's 80 years old, and he says to him, from the burning bush, I want you to go to Egypt where he's running for his life because he killed an Egyptian. Hey, I want you to go back to Egypt, Egypt, go right in front of the Pharaoh and say to Pharaoh, let my people go. Thus says Yahweh, thus says the Lord, let my people go. And he said, and at the onset, he said to Moses, he says, he's not going to let him go. He's going to harden his heart. And ten times he's going to harden his heart. And I will show him signs and wonders. And what he did was he, he sent plagues on Egypt. He turned the river of Nile uh, to blood. He sent them a plague of frogs, a plague of gnats, a plague of flies. Uh, locusts ate the um, ate, ate, uh, hail, destroyed their crops, and locusts ate whatever was left. And in the end, there was this darkness that you could feel. But it was only among the Egyptians, not among the Hebrews in Goshen. And then the final plague after Pharaoh had said no ten times, uh, God sent a plague to take the firstborn of every Egyptian family. Now, this is a horrific plague, but we, and we say, oh, how could God do that? Well, what was Pharaoh doing? Pharaoh was killing the sons of the Hebrews. He was having them tossed into the Nile so that they couldn't reproduce and, and grow as a nation. So before we get all bent out of shape of what God was doing, remember what Pharaoh was doing to the Hebrews at first. So God says to the Hebrews, you're going to slaughter a lamb, perfect lamb, spotless lamb, and you're going to take its blood and you're going to take a branch of hyssop and paint the lamb's blood over the doorpost and the lintel of every house in the Hebrews. And when I see that blood, when I see the house that is covered by the blood of the lamb, I will pass over it. And death will not come in. It's a picture of Christ. It's a picture of Christ, the blood that he shed for us. Right? Well, so the people saw the ten plagues. They saw the, the final play where they took the, he took the firstborn of every Egyptian. And then Pharaoh says, you know what? Go, get out of my country. Just get out of my sight. Just go. Take everything and go. And, and the Hebrews plundered the Egyptians. They took, they, they plundered them as if they had defeated them in war, which they in fact had. Okay. And so uh, they go out and, and they go out all the way to, the Red Sea. Now they're pinned against, they have the Red Sea on one hand and the wilderness behind them, and there's no place for them to go. And the and Pharaoh says, well, what a bunch of rubes. I'm gonna, this will be easy. I'm just going to go out there with my chariots and destroy them all. Kill every single one of them. 
And so he went out with his chariots. But God stood as a pillar of fire between the Hebrews and the Egyptians and kept them from coming toward them. And then he divided the waters of the Red Sea. The, the, the Bible actually tells us that the water stood as a wall on either side of the Hebrews as they walked through on dry ground. This wasn't the tide going out. This wasn't like the, the water was coming back a little bit. They didn't wade through. They went through on dry ground. The water formed a wall on either side of them. When they got to the other side, the Pharaoh's army rushed in, the, the, the pillar of fire dissipated, and they rushed into the gap, foolish, and the water crashed down on them and wiped out the entire army. The Hebrews didn't lift a finger. God did it all. They watched him do it. And then in, uh, that's, that's, we're up to Exodus chapter 15. Uh, then there's this great uh, song of praise that Moses sings and teaches to the people. And Miriam uh, takes up her tambourine and starts singing this song. Um, uh, sing praises to God for he has given us glorious victory. He says, she says, the, uh, the, the horse and chariot he has tossed into the sea. Right? So everything's really high. Then we come to chapter 17. And in chapter 17, they're wandering in the wilderness and they come to a place called Rephidim. And in Rephidim, there's, there's, there's no water and there's about 2 million Hebrews and they start to grumble. And they start to say, did you bring us out into the desert just to kill us? That's, that's their response, their exact word. Did you bring us out into the desert just to kill us? Where's the faith? They saw what God had done. They saw what God had accomplished. They, and, the, and now they think that God has just abandoned them to die? So God tells Moses something very specific. And, and, and this is another picture of what happened with Christ. Okay? He said... You're going to take the, the church, you're going to take the elders of the congregation, and you're going to take your staff in your hand, piece of wood. And you're going to come to this rock at Rephidim. I'm going to, God tells him, I'm going to stand on that rock before you, and you're going to strike that rock with your staff. What's he telling them? He's telling them that. He himself, God, is bearing the punishment for their infidelity, for their faithlessness. In striking the rock, Moses is striking God. And that's what happened to Jesus. He carried the wood of his own crucifixion up Mount Calvary and stretched out his arms to be killed at the behest of the Jewish leaders. And he took on their sins on the cross. So Moses strikes the rock, the rock splits open, and living water comes pouring out. It really is a, a fantastic picture of Christ. But that's what happened. Moses called that place Masa and Meribah, which means rebellion and testing, because they rebelled against God and they tested God in the wilderness. And that's what he's talking about here. Harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works 40 years. Now, in the book of Numbers, chapter 14, we come to a part where the, the people send into the promised land 10 spies. And these 10, or 12 spies, I'm sorry, one from each tribe. 12 spies go in. Twelve spies come out. They bring some of the produce of the land. There is a cluster of grapes that's so large it takes two guys to carry a pole between them. It's, and they're like, this, this land is fantastic. It does indeed flow with milk and honey. It is a, an amazing place. But, there's always a but, right? But, they have fortified cities. They have warriors. Uh, we can't go in there and we can't defeat them. They forget what God's been doing with them this whole time. They forgot. Two people, Caleb, son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, son of Nun. They were two of the spies. They said, 
Let's go. Let's go right now and conquer this land because God has given it to us. Let's go. Come on. <laughs> and they said, no, we can't do it. We can't do it. The people are, they're, they're like giants. We're like grasshoppers to them, you know? And so the people refused. And God said to them, you will not enter into my rest. And that's where it says here. So I swear, in, uh, wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said, they do always err in their heart and have, they have not known my way. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. That points to the completion of God's work. God's rest is the completion. Okay, in Genesis chapter 2, on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. He didn't rest because he was tired. He rested because the work was done. He completed it. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. Now, why do we as Christians celebrate the Sabbath on the first day of the week and not on the seventh. Okay, there are some Christian de denominations like Seventh-day Adventists who insist that you are breaking the Torah because you are celebrating the Sabbath or observing the Sabbath on the first day of the week, not on the seventh day. But when Jesus hung on the cross and before he died, he cried out, it is finished. He gave up his spirit. He was buried in the tomb. And on the first day of the week, in the very early morning of the first day of the week, he rose from the dead. He conquered death. And that is why Christians enter into God's rest on the first day of the week, because that is the day when God completed his work of salvation in Jesus Christ. And so we're talking about entering into the rest, but he, he told his, he told these people, everyone that he brought out, every single one that he brought out, they would not enter into his rest. Now, verse 12, we're going to get into that rebellion part in a little bit, but first he looks at like a good preacher, he takes one word, and that word is today, okay? Uh, verse 12, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily while it is called today. That word today, he gets it right from the beginning of his uh his, his passage from Psalm 95. Today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. And the word today speaks of the urgency, the immediacy of the issue. Verses 12 through 14 is an exhortation to the brothers who are fellow believers. Okay, And believe me when I say he's not just talking to the brethren, he's also talking to the sisterin, right? They, they are... They beware of any unbelief among them because the sin of unbelief is separation from God because when we disbelieve God, we're effectively calling him a liar. We're saying, no, God, you can't do what you said you were going to do. You're not going to do what you said you were going to do. You, you're not going to come through on your promises. We're calling God a liar and we're saying, I don't believe you. And that's a great and grievous sin. Verse 13 says, exhort one another daily while it is called today. To exhort one another is to encourage one another. Walk side by side with your fellow believers, creating unity and singleness of purpose. The sheep must remain gathered in the fold. Hebrews chapter 10, he's going to revisit this and say, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. And again, he says today. Exhort one another daily while it is called today. He's focusing on the immediacy and urgency of this exhortation. Lest any of you be hardened 
through the deceitfulness of sin. To be hardened is like when we ignore the prompting of the Holy Spirit, we are increasingly less sensitive to it. Just as a callus hardens the skin against injury, before you have calluses, if you are, if you are a worker with your hands, right, you develop calluses over time. Why? Because originally you were getting blisters, weren't you? Right? Um, whenever I would play the, the guitar with steel strings, my fingers would hurt, but the more I played, the less it hurt because I developed calluses on the ends of my fingers. My pop pop, who, who played uh, the guitar every single day of his life, had thick calluses on the ends of his hands, on the ends of his fingers, right? He probably couldn't even feel anything anymore. I was watching a video earlier this week of this guy who, um, he says, I want you to see this. And he opens up a smoker and he says, look at this. And he, he reaches in with his bare hand, he grabs a cast iron skillet <laughs> full of apple pie. He says, look at this smoked apple pie. It's been spoken for 10 hours at 300 degrees. I'm like, dude, you're, why are you holding that with your hand? A cast iron skillet, 300 degrees? He's not feeling it. Why? Because his hands are calloused over. It's like wearing a pair of oven mitts. You know, he's been doing it for so long. We can be like that. When we sin, it stings. But if we ignore that sting and continue to sin, we develop these calluses. We harden our hearts. And then all of a sudden, we're not listening to the prompt of the Holy Spirit speaking to us anymore. And that's what he's warning them against here. He says... Exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Does sin deceive? Yes, it does. Sin deceives. The original sin was to question the word of God. The serpent said, did God really say that? He didn't. Not in so many words. Oh, you won't surely die. That was the first sin, to question the word of God, to disbelieve the word of God. Isaiah chapter 40, uh, 44 and verse 20 says, He feeds on ashes. A deluded heart has led him astray, and he cannot deliver himself or say, Is there not a lie in my right hand? After a while, you start to believe the lies. You, you, you just, it's just part of who you are. Romans 7 and 11 says, For sin, this is Paul speaking, on himself. Sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it, killed me. That's what sin does. We are dead in our trespasses and sins, but God makes us alive through Jesus Christ. Verse 14 mirrors verse 6. He says, for what we are made partakers of Christ if we, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast until the end. It sounds a lot like what he says in verse 6. But Christ is a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. That word for holding fast, that Greek word, it, it, it implies like a ship's anchor that is held, that holds the ship firmly in a storm, okay? He focuses the first part of this examination, this exposition, on the word today. And now he looks and focuses on the rebellion aspect of this passage, okay? Verse 15, while it is said, he repeats, repeats it again, goes back, today if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation or the rebellion, okay? Verse 16, for some, when they had heard, did provoke. Howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses, not everyone rebelled. There were two who did not. Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun. They were the only two who were faithful. Even Moses was not allowed into the promised land only out of the, the, the whole generation of the Hebrew slaves who came out of Egypt, only Caleb and Joshua were the only two who went into the promised land. The rest of them died in the wilderness and their children went in. And why? All that Moses led out rebelled against going into the promised land with the exception of Caleb, 
son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, son of Nun. Verse 17. But with whom was he grieved for 40 years? Was it not with them that had sinned whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? You see, when they rebelled, when they said, God can't take us in there, God can't give us the promised land, what they said was, you brought us out here for us to be defeated by our enemies. They will slaughter us and then they will take our children as slaves. That's what they said. So this is what God says. God says in Numbers chapter 14, the Lord spoke to me, Moses and to Aaron saying, how long shall this wicked congregation grumble against me? I have heard the grumblings of the people of Israel, which they grumble against me. Say to them, as I live, declares the Lord, what you have said in my hearing, I will do to you. Your dead bodies shall fall in this wilderness and of all your number listed in the census from 20 years old and upward who have grumbled against me, not one shall come into the land where I swore that I would make you dwell except Caleb, son of Jephunneh and Joshua, son of Nun. But your little ones who you said would become a prey, I will bring in and they shall know the land that you have rejected. It was their unbelief that kept them in the wilderness for 40 years. They weren't lost. God would not allow them to go into the promised land because of their unbelief. The people refused to take possession. Verse 18, whom, to whom swear he that they could, should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not. They refused to take the possession of the promised land because of fear. Fear is the opposite of faith. Their sin was unbelief. They did not trust God to bring them into the land that he promised to them. Deuteronomy chapter 1. So after, after 40 years of wandering in the, in the wilderness, Moses calls them all together and he gives them a little pep talk. Six different sermons, right? And they're all recorded in the book of Deuteronomy. Book of Deuteronomy, the Deut word Deuteronomy means second law. It's a second giving of the law. He's basically recapping everything for this generation, this new generation, which, by the way, they were all either 20 and younger uh, 40 years ago, or they hadn't been born yet, or they were born in the wilderness, right? So this whole new generation, they didn't see the, the, the 10 plagues. They didn't, walk, they didn't see the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the dividing of the Red Sea. And so Moses is going to tell them all about it. That's what Deuteronomy is all about. It's like a recap of everything they've been doing for the last 40 years. But here in Deuteronomy chapter 1, he begins by saying, And the Lord heard your words and was angered, and he swore. Now, they weren't their words. It was the words of their parents, but he's talking about the people as a whole. Not one of these men of this evil generation shall see the good land that I swore to give to your fathers, except Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and also uh, Joshua, son of Nun, he mentions later on, he shall see it, and to him and to his children I will give the land on which he has trodden, because, because he has wholly followed the Lord. He did not lose his faith. He did not disbelieve. He wanted to go in and conquer it. And everybody else said no. Verse 19. So we see... He's, he's bringing this whole thing. He says, okay, so everything that I've told you now, that now you see. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Because unbelief is a sin in that we are not trusting the power and the promise of the Lord. People today, even believers, scoff at the notion of hearing God speak to us of hearing his voice but those of us who have been reborn of water and the spirit have God's spirit dwelling in us he's not a passive tenant but he speaks to us through our conscience telling us stay the course when we anchor our lives in the word of God we can weather any storm as Paul said in his letter to the Romans if God is for us who can be against us so my exhortation for us today is the exhortation of the writer of Hebrews 
if, you, if we hear the voice of God speaking to us, we ought not to harden our hearts. We ought not to close our ears to the gentle whisper of God's Spirit in us. If God is taking us to it, He will take us through it. So I encourage you today, hear His voice. Know that He's calling you into His rest and obey. Let us pray. O oh God, there have been many times when we have ignored your voice, when we have turned to our own way in unbelief, calling into question the promises that you have made to us in your holy word. Let today not be that day, Lord. Speak to us in the stillness. We have seen your promises fulfilled time and time again. You have brought the people of Israel out of bondage in Egypt, and by your son's death and resurrection, you have delivered us from bondage to sin and death. Your promises are yes and amen. And so we hear your voice and we believe in you. We will walk the path you have laid before us and where you send us, we will go. And we will proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ to a world in desperate need of good news by the strength and word of your Holy Spirit. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening to Guerrilla Christianity. My prayer is that you have been blessed by the hearing of God's word as I have been blessed in preparing this message. God has also blessed me by calling me to serve two churches in Salem County, New Jersey, Ebenezer United Methodist Church in Auburn and Hudson United Methodist Church in Pedricktown. We are two Bible-believing, gospel-preaching, Christ-adoring churches in the heart of New Jersey's farmland. If you live in the area and don't have a church family to call your own, I'd like to invite you to join us for worship on Sunday mornings. Ebenezer's worship service meets at 9 a.m. and Hudson's worship service meets at 10.30. And if you don't live in the area, get involved with the church where you are. We are not called to be Christians in isolation, but in community. So get involved with a Bible-believing congregation and be a part of the body of Christ. Now, if you like Guerrilla Christianity and want to help support us, there are a couple things you can do and it won't cost you a penny. First, subscribe to the podcast on whatever podcast or platform you use. We are available on most platforms as well as on smart devices. We are also on YouTube with full videos of the sermons. Second, give us a like and leave a comment on the podcast. That helps boost our visibility and puts the message of the gospel in front of more people. Third, you can share these podcasts to people who need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our mission is to declare the love of God in Jesus Christ to all the world. Stay in the word, keep growing, and I hope you'll join us again next time on Guerrilla Christianity. Until then, remember this, Christ died for you, now go live for Christ.